All right, so for Fed number 70, my thesis is a strong executive is a good thing, uh, not a bad thing, especially a unitary executive. So key points, you got to consider the source, uh, Alexander Hamilton himself. And then just two things on this uh, to really hit it on. We need a vigorous executive. Uh, so not low energy Jeb Bush or me on the first one of these videos I made a long time ago that dictator Dresden left to comment on, said I was low energy. Uh, it still hurts me to this day. Uh, and there should be one executive, not two. You have a unitary executive. So real quick on the author here, uh, I say consider the source because this guy had a front row seat to General Washington during the American Revolution. Uh, he was his chief of staff or something like that. And he saw uh, like God in action because that's basically how people thought about Washington. I recently just read 1776 by David McCulloch. I'm looking at it and all the books I've read, all of my friends. Uh, and like Washington's a demigod. Uh, he was a singular person who had this incredible ability to motivate men by his actions, by his words, by the way he held himself, by the values that he lived by that were so respected during that time that men looked at him and his actions spurred others to act. And that's what we need in an executive is what Hamilton's going to argue. And he did not have a better model for it. Uh, as Washington is so incredibly important to our country because of the precedents he set uh, and the dignity in spite of his flaws that he was willing uh, or that, that he, he, he put into really so much of what he did. And to just remember, this guy's a federalist. Uh, he, he likes big government comparative to the confederal option. He favored the English model. He, he based so much of what we did off of them. You figure like, you know, back to your AP U.S. history or eighth grade U.S. history, whatever you took with that stuff, you know, how he, what he did with the debt, uh, trying to make us based off the English model. I mean, so it just makes sense that he's going to argue for this for those reasons. So two things. One, we need a vigorous executive. So that obviously ties back to what I was just talking about. Uh, but this here is a quote, which I'm going to add some quotations to, so it's clear here. And I'm just going to kind of speak to it. I just broke it up uh, into these parts, so I'm going to speak about them. Energy in the executive is a leading character in the definition of good government. It is essential to the protection of the community against foreign attacks. Uh, I mean, take a look at FDR and what he did in terms of giving his life, in essence, um, to really lead our country throughout World War II. Um, I mean, there's so much I could go on for that, because unlike dictator Dresden, um, <clears throat> me and him are the same person. But you do need that. Uh, you need somebody who, again, like Washington, is able to rally the troops in a way that uh, can bring our country together. You think about the rally around the flag concept that has occurred uh, so many times. And really, we need that person to uh, to be the one who will, um, you know, set the stage to to make the argument, for instance, as to why we need to go to war, or we need someone who's going to inspire confidence into the people that this person is the right person to lead us uh, in times of war. So, right there, you figure the number one job of our government. Uh, the national government, excuse me, and it really was the case for so long until uh, that shift in 33 with the election of 32 was like national security. It was just it was just protection it was foreign affairs, things like that. So we need to be able to protect uh, our country against foreign attacks. And you take a look at some of the weak points in our country uh, militarily, uh, historically, you put those two together. It's when we had a leader who did not do that great of a job in that instance. You look at a James Madison or some of the failures Jefferson left him with an LBJ, for instance, uh, with Vietnam. Second, it is uh, protection of foreign attacks. That didn't sound right. It is not less essential to the steady administration of the laws. So you figure one of the most impactful, important, powerful things uh, in the Constitution for the president is the take care clause and that ability to ensure that, hey, look, like, I'm mean, think about it in this context. Like, I say our government is the biggest business in the world because you got one guy 
who is running uh, a business with like what, what we what was our a couple of years ago, I think what, our whole this is when I talk and think at the same time and I just start stuttering. Like, <laughs> uh, but I think our total expenditures or something like 3.7 trillion, something like that, you know, like, could you imagine running that? Like my wife's in charge of like $2 million in her job. And that's a huge responsibility that she has to work so much for. So like this guy's running the biggest business in the world. He's administering these laws that impact so many people's lives. So he's got to be able to do that. Uh, I would just point to George Washington with uh, the Whiskey Rebellion. People weren't willing to follow it, so he took troops in there. And uh, he laid down the law, even though it was like a bunch of, like, uh, I mean, I'm getting facts mixed up in my head. I'm a mess on this video, but I ain't starting again or restarting. I can't even say that right. This is video seven. Bear with me. Um, but you look at... Washington with the Whiskey Rebellion being able to say, look, if you don't follow these laws, I'll take action here. So it's just those ideas. You know, we got someone who's going to be willing to hold country accountable and be in a position where they're going to be able to implement those laws. Who third, to the protection of property against those irregular and high-handed combinations, which sometimes interrupt the ordinary just uh, ordinary course of justice. Right. So we want a guy who's going to be able to ensure that uh, our rights are protected, our property is protected, so on and so forth. I'm not going to go through all these because I'm just rambling at this point. But if we're going to have a republic this size with uh, all these things that they're going to be responsible for, we're going to want to have somebody who is going to be able to lead our country. So thank you if you just listened through that. And then the other one, there should be one executive, not two. He's going to push for the argument of having a unitary executive as to maybe a couple of people in here or having a group of people around the executive. So number one, that unity is conducive to energy, will not be disputed. Decision, activity, secrecy, and dispatch will generally characterize the proceedings of one man in much more eminent degree than the proceedings of any greater number. And in proportion as that number is increased, these qualities will be diminished. So basically, like, look, if you want to get the job done, uh, we're going to need decision, activity, secrecy. And as the job grows, those things are going to be that much more important. Thus, if we want to be able to get this done as effectively as possible, uh, we need one person doing that. So that that one person, uh, and obviously with his cabinet around him and the such, are going to be able to make decisions that can't be exploited. Uh, I guess you could kind of throw in there just that idea of leaks that we see and how tough that can make for the president's job. Well, imagine if you had multiple presidents uh, and you know combating against one another, it'd be tough. Two, uh, second detail, uh, wherever two or more persons are engaged in any common enterprise or pursuit, there's always a danger of difference of opinion. So we talked about this before, but like, think about if you had a populist president and you had an elitist president and they're both meant to work together. Like, how's that going to happen? Uh, we see difficulties within our own parties. So imagine if you had two powerful presidents who were two totally different people, it'd be incredibly tough. And that leads to the last one. They might impede or frustrate the most important measures of the government in the most critical emergencies of the state. And what is still worse, they might split the community into the most violent and irreconcilable factions adhering differently to the different. I can't read because my face is there. But think about it this way. Like we even run into issues today with the president's ability to administer the law because uh, sometimes, for instance, like when Donald Trump came in and became President Trump, he pulled back so much on the Affordable Care Act because he didn't like what Obama had done before. So uh, imagine if we have that elitist president and we also have that, you know, populist president uh, and they're not willing to work together. They're not willing to implement the laws and say they turn it as a political ploy against the other one and point the finger at that guy compared to this guy. Well, what happens then? Uh, you're running into two people sharing uh, this immense power that is meant to lead our country. And instead, they're using that for political means to divide the country because they have two different views on maybe how the laws should be implemented or what laws should be implemented. Uh, and then because it's easy for people to excite the passions of others, especially if we're in this like big country where uh, we don't always trust the other people. And that ultimately what will grow out of that is 
is going to be me versus you. And if that's happening within our executive, well, that really goes against what we need, which is energy in the executive. We need somebody who has the room, the space, the secrecy uh, to be able to speak to his confidants, to be able to speak to his advisors, to be able to take action when action is needed. And if we have two presidents of two different positions from two different parts of the country with two different ideas, uh, it's going to be immensely difficult to actually achieve those goals. And ultimately, that could end up ripping our country apart comparative to actually enhancing the position of the executive itself. So I did so much better on that than the previous slide. And I'm at the point now where I can't really see straight because I'm just talking and rambling and not breathing and not drinking the water. That's right there. One more. That's 78 next. <laughs>